you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1 today. Straight before 2 Peter. So, there is a uh, Sunday school teacher uh, that asked each member of her Sunday school class to write one sentence on what Easter means to me. What would you answer? Think about that. What would you answer to that question? How would you answer it? One student answered... Egg, sa egg salad sandwiches for the next two weeks. That's what Easter meant for them. I hope not. I was not a huge uh, egg salad guy. Uh, but it is Easter Sunday, which Easter means uh, different things, different people. For some, I guess, it's Easter egg hunts. Uh, for some, it's awful marshmallow candy called Peeps. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry to have been Peep fans, but I'm not a big fan. Cadbury cream eggs, maybe? Uh, whatever else. But for those of us who are believers, for those of us who are Christians, those of us who have been changed and forgiven by Jesus Christ, Easter is about a whole lot more uh, than candy. It's a whole, a whole lot more than ham, scavenger hunts, uh, egg salad sandwiches. Easter is about life. It's about hope. It's about forgiveness. Uh, and it's all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, as Christians, we don't necessarily just celebrate the resurrection on Easter Sunday, at least I hope we don't, uh, because as believers, the resurrection should be at the forefront uh, of our thoughts and our minds every day of our lives, because it is that important to each one of us. So we see the importance of the resurrection to our lives, to our everyday living in the text that we're going to look at this morning. There are a lot of different places we could go on Easter Sunday, uh, which is one of the challenges of preaching uh, Easter Sunday, is which one to choose? Where should I go? Uh, well, today we're going to look at 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Before we look at the text, just a little bit of background. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with Peter. Uh, Peter is a man who was one of Christ's closest followers. Uh, he's also a man who failed, who sinned greatly uh, against his Lord and Savior. So he's a man who understands the scourge. He's a man that we can relate to. But he's also a man who was transformed by the risen Christ. He saw the resurrected Christ with his own eyes, and, and that changed him forever. Uh, and, and so he goes from running scared from the authorities that he thought was going to take his life to actually risking his life to preach the gospel, all because he saw Jesus Christ risen. And so he writes this letter to a group of believers who needed hope, who needed encouragement, because they were being persecuted. Uh, they lived in a hostile culture, so life was difficult for them, life was hard. They were abused, they were hated, they were poor, they were intimidated, they were troubled. Uh, they had little resources. So they were living in a difficult world. We live in a difficult world. Life isn't easy. Maybe today uh, things for you haven't been going well. It hasn't been going well for a while. Um, life is full of disappointments. It's full of discouragement. It's full of uh, letdowns. And so God knows this. And, and God uses Peter to write this letter uh, to a specific group of Christians, but also to us today live in a fallen world in need of hope, in need of uh, encouragement. And so Peter bases his hope and his encouragement on this hymn of praise that he starts out with in verses 3 through 5. And, and so here we see how the resurrection of Jesus Christ can and should shape the rest of our lives. It should impact the way that we live our lives, not just on Easter Sunday, but every single day of our lives. So let's look at 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope, a living hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your thank you for his resurrection from the, from the grave. Lord, we thank you how, for, for the fact that that can impact our lives in such dramatic ways, and we thank you for this portion of scripture that we can look at, and we ask that uh, as we do that, we ask that you would transform us. You would help us to uh, live in light of Christ's resurrection. Give us uh, the power and the ability to do just that. We, we ask that you be magnified, you be glorified in our time together. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Peter begins this letter to a hurt, uh, confused, uh, suffering set of believers with a hymn of praise, which is interesting because 
And oftentimes, the last thing we feel like doing when we're down is praising God for anything. Well, that's how Peter stopped. Uh, he says, uh, I want you, he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. And because Jesus is risen, praise is always possible. And that's how Peter begins. Peter begins with this doxology. And the word blessed here literally means to speak well of. Uh, it's actually, the Greek word is, is the word for eulogy, uh, which, you know, we do it up here normally, to speak well of a person. Well, the one that we can completely and always speak well of is our God. And the reason Peter says we can bless God, we can praise God, we can speak well of God no matter what, is because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And that's really the thing that, uh, that this whole thing hinges on, is Christ's resurrection, because that, the central truth of Christianity the fact that Jesus is alive. And because of that, praise is always possible. Joy is always possible. Christ-like living is always possible because Jesus Christ is alive. And so that's the reality that allows us to rejoice, no matter what is going on. And that's the reality that Peter points this suffering uh, set of believers to, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ allows us to rejoice. It allows us to, to praise him. And so the central idea of this passage is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us a hope that empowers us to live for Jesus Christ boldly and joyfully, no matter what may come our way. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us the power to live for him no matter what. It gives us the power to live joyfully. It should prompt us to praise God no matter what. This is why we gather each and every Sunday morning. Each and every Sunday to praise God because of the fact that he has conquered sin, the fact that he has conquered death. It's the reality of the resurrection that changes us and it gives us hope in this life and it gives us hope for the next life as well. So how does Jesus Christ's resurrection change the way we live? We'll look at three points today. The first one is the resurrection of Jesus Christ means that we can be born again even though we were dead in sin. Because Jesus Christ went to the cross, died and rose again, our lives can be changed. Our eternities can be changed. Look at verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So right off the bat here we see that the resurrection changes something. It's something that shapes our lives. It changes here and now and it changes eternity. If Jesus died on the cross and he stayed dead, then he was just a man in the long line of men who died for a cause. And as far as that goes, we might as well be doing something else with our Jesus was still dead. You know, why would you come here and, and sit and listen to me? There'd be no reason for it. No reason to sit and be yelled at on a Sunday morning, right? Because Jesus is still dead. But since Jesus Christ did what no other person can do, he rose himself from the grave, we can have new life. We can be born again. We can hold our heads high in this world, no matter what this world may throw at us. And that's what Peter's saying. No matter what, we can speak well of God, we can praise him. We should praise him. Why? Because he's begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Begotten us again means to be born again. Well, why do we need to be born again? What's wrong with, what's wrong with my first birth? I thought it was pretty good. I thought it turned out okay, right? Now, we don't begin. The reason why is because we don't begin this life as children of God, despite what people might think. We don't belong to his family. We don't have an inheritance in heaven. That's not the way we start out in this life. Ephesians 2 tells us that as we are born in this world, we're, we're children of wrath. We belong to another family, to another kingdom. We belong to Satan and his kingdom. We follow sin. We don't desire God because in reality, we're, we, we're born wanting to be God. That's how every human being begins life. And that's how every human being, being I can't say being and begin in the same sentence, so I shouldn't try um, that's how every human being goes through life without Jesus Christ. From a very early age, you see it in children. Now, when I was a kid, I, I thought it was pretty good. But, you know, I was blind to my own sins, but I could see my own children's sins very clearly. Um, so I know children are, are born sinners. It's always easier to see sin in somebody else, isn't it? And the reality of the situation is that we are broken from birth. We are sinners from birth. As a matter of fact, there's a report in the Minnesota Crime Commission, I don't know what year it was, but that doesn't really matter. It says, every baby starts out life as a little savage. These are not my words. Uh, so I don't want to get angry letters. Although you're like, yes, that's exactly right. He is completely selfish and self-centered. 
He wants what he wants, when he wants it. His bottle, his mother's attention, his playmate's toy, his uncle's watch. Deny him these wants, and he seethes with, seethes with rage and aggressiveness, which would be murderous were he not so helpless. He is dirty. He has no morals, no knowledge, no skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, are born delinquent. And if allowed to continue in this self-centered world of his infancy, given free reign to his impulsive actions to satisfy his wants, every child would grow up a criminal. Right? Who wants babies now, right? <laughs> right? You'll never look at babies the same way again. Or you think, yes, I know. I have one of these at home. <laughs> or I had one at one point. We know this. This is how the Bible describes us too. It describes us as rebels, those who are enemies of God. Those who seek to overrule and overthrow the true king of the universe by living our own lives apart from him, wanting what we want, when we want it. So we never really outgrow all of that. At least not in terms of our submission to God. And so that means that we are deserving of punishment from the king whom we, rebel, whom we have rebelled against. And so the grim reality for us is that we deserve Punishment because of our sinful rebellion. In fact, Jesus tells a man named Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He cannot see the kingdom of God. He can't see God. So we need to be born again. Now, we bristle against this as unbelievers. It offends unbelievers. You don't like this. I don't want to think that there's anything wrong with me. I was born this way, and I'm perfect the way that I am. I don't need to change. Everyone else needs to change. I don't need to change. Society needs to change. The meat, my way of living. Right? That's what we see in this world. I'm not wrong, but everyone else is. I don't need Jesus. I don't need anyone to fix me. So we rebel against the idea that we need a Savior. The Bible teaches us, and we know by experience, that none of us are looking for God in our sin nature, in our, our first birth, without the new birth. We've all sinned. We've all missed God's standard. We've all missed the mark. We've all missed perfection in our thoughts, in our nature, in our affections, in our actions. We've not lived up to God's standard, no matter how good we think we are. And so because of that, we deserve punishment. That's what the Bible tells us. We're sinners, and we don't stand a chance at forgiveness. We don't have a prayer for salvation without Jesus Christ, without his death, without his burial and resurrection. And so the only reason that forgiveness is possible at all is because God is a merciful God. He is a loving and gracious God. And that's what Peter says here. He says, according to his abundant mercy, he has caused us to be born again. And so the idea here is that God would have still been good, even if he didn't make a way of salvation for us. That's hard for us to think about. But it's real. It's true. God didn't have to save any of us. But because his mercy overflows, and he has compassion for the weak, compassion for sinners, he sends Jesus. He sends Jesus to die for our sins. And Jesus not only died, but he rose again. That's what mercy is. It means compassion and misery. We were born into a pitiful condition, a hopeless state. And so God shows us mercy by providing a way to escape the punishment we we deserve to be punished. And so God shows abundant mercy. He gives Jesus Christ the only way for a holy and just God to forgive us is through a perfect substitute, through a Savior, someone who can rescue us from the sin and the punishment that we deserve. And that's where Jesus comes in. He came in as our substitute to stand in the place of us, under God's wrath, to take it upon himself. He's the only person that can do this. He hung on a cross face separation from the Father for you and me. And so our hope and our forgiveness is possible because Jesus Christ came, because he went to the cross, and because he was risen from the dead. And so that's what we celebrate today. And that's what we celebrate at the communion table. The bread and the cup that represent Jesus, his, his body, his humanity, and the shed blood of our Savior. And so as we partake of this observance in a little while, remember the price that was paid. Remember what Jesus has done for you to save your soul. That he died in your place. That he suffered greatly when he did that. It's a vivid picture and a vivid reminder of what God has done. The love that he has for us. The grace and mercy that he shows us. 
In Isaiah 53, 5, it says, He was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So Jesus steps in, faces the Father's wrath, so that you and I can be forgiven. So how are we forgiven? How can we be born again? I want to be born again. How do we do it? It's not by attending church. Jesus doesn't say to Nicodemus, he doesn't say, well, uh, you must be born again, so go to synagogue every day. Give a bunch of money uh, to the synagogue. He doesn't say any of that. He doesn't say, clean up your act and come, come to me and I'll see if you've earned this, uh, this new birth. No, he says in John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. The reason I'm a Christian has nothing to do with me. I'm not holier than anyone here. I'm not, I'm not a better person. The reason why I'm a believer is because of God's abundant mercy. Because he had mercy on me. I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve forgiveness. No one does. But Jesus Christ gave his life for me. He gave his life for you. He rose from the grave so that you could be forgiven. We can be born again if we trust in Jesus Christ. We admit that we are sinners and we need a Savior. We ask him to save us and he will. So we can be born again because Christ rose from the grave, it says. He's begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it says at the end of verse 3. And Christ's resurrection is the proof that the payment was accepted. When Jesus says, it is finished, this is the price, the price has been paid in full, the resurrection is that stamp of approval. It's the Father's amen to what happened on the cross. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us new life to those of us who were once dead in sin. Have you received new life? Are you born again here today? If not, repent and trust in Jesus. If you are, rejoice and continue trusting in Jesus no matter what. So that's the first thing we see, that the resurrection gives us new life. The second thing we see is the resurrection of Jesus Christ means we have a living hope in a dying world. In verse 3, again, it says he has begotten us again unto a living hope, a lively hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, Jesus Christ, again, was still in the tomb. Our hope is dead along with him. But because Christ has been raised, we now have a hope that is living because he is that hope. Now, if anyone understood hope and a living hope, it was Peter. Peter's a man who walked with Jesus. He's a man who learned from Jesus, who saw Jesus, saw Jesus raise people from the dead. He witnessed and restored the, the sight of the blind, saw him calm the storm, feed 5,000 people with only five loaves and two fish. Peter was an eyewitness to all of them. He was even allowed to walk on water by Jesus. A man who followed Jesus, loved Jesus, but also failed Jesus. When Jesus died on that Friday, Peter had very little hope. His world came crashing down when his Lord cried out and his finished on the cross. Peter had given up his promising fishing career. I don't know if he'd taken off in that, but he, he gave up that fishing career to follow Jesus Christ. And that's what he did for three years. Through thick and thin, until it mattered most, until Jesus uh, is arrested in his final days, when the heat got turned up, Peter turned his back on his Lord and Savior, denying him three times, not just once, but three times. After he said, no way, they may deny you, but I never will. He did. And then in a tragic scene as Jesus is walking uh, away, being arrested, he, he looks at Peter, right in the eyes, and Peter sees him. And after Jesus gets through, Peter runs off and weeps bitterly. He's sobbing. This was more than this man could handle. Because this is the last image. Can you imagine standing there as Jesus is going to the cross? And you've just denied him. Even though you said you wouldn't. And Jesus is gone. He's gone. That's the last image you have as Jesus is dying on the cross. And as far as you know, your hopes and dreams, everything is out the window. Jesus is in that grave because I didn't pay attention that uh, he said he was going to rise again a few days later. Everything has gone up in storm in the last three years. The man that I loved and cared about is gone. And the last image that I have is of him looking at me right after I denied him. How do you recover from something like that? You don't. If Jesus stayed dead. 
You don't if Jesus doesn't rise from the grave. You never recover from that. You go back, maybe, you go back to fishing, and you never heard from him again. Or worse, you do something else. But thankfully, the story doesn't end there for Peter. It doesn't have to end there for us either, because if it did, that's a miserable ending. That's a tragic story. And what a hopeless existence it is for Peter and the rest of us if it ends there. But God doesn't leave us without hope. The only way you get past such a colossal failure, the only way you get past such wicked sin is if the man that you turn your back on, the man that you sin against, rises from the grave and forgives you. And that's exactly what happened for Peter. And that's one of the reasons why we can trust the resurrection account. That we know that it really happened because something happened in Peter's life. There was a total transformation. Because this was a man who left early and ran out and was done who didn't want to be associated with Jesus, and, and then he sees the risen Lord later, and now he has hope, now he has life, now he has confidence, now he has boldness. Now he's willing to die for his faith, and he does. Why? Because something happened. Jesus Christ rose from the grave. You don't recover from that either, but a different way. You're never the same. Peter never, was never the same. He didn't want to be associated with Jesus. Now he's like, I'll go to my grave. And, and there's one story in the book of Acts, where he's going to be put to death. And he's sleeping in prison. That's how confident he was. I'm going to be with my Savior. Because he was completely changed. Because Jesus had risen from the dead. That's hope. That's a living hope right there. And that's what Peter writes about here. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Living hope means exactly what it sounds like. It's alive. It's breathing. It's not dead. This is a hope that doesn't go away when we take our final breath. You know, there are a lot of things we can put our hope in. So we can put it in a career. We can put it in a, a spouse, or our kids, our country, our, our dreams, our homes, our education, money. Some people put their hopes in the stock market, and then their mood changes, whether the stocks are up or down. Put it in fame, projects, this or that. But as the writer of Ecclesiastes points out, it's all going away. It's all vanity. It's hopeless. Somebody wrote once, you don't see hearses carrying around new hall trailers because all that stuff, it's dying hope. It doesn't last. We live in a world where people put their hopes in dying things. Without God, all you have dying hope. So Ephesians 2 12 says, it says that at the time when you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's a hopeless existence without Jesus Christ. A lost only know a hope that dies. Dreams that turn to ashes. That's why God says in his word, if in this world only you have hope, you're of all men most miserable because there's no hope here. There's no living hope here. It's all dying hope. Jesus Christ is the living hope. When you're born into the family of God, you have a hope that will never die because Jesus is alive. And this hope is not wishful thinking. It's not like, well, I hope it's nice tomorrow. I hope it doesn't rain on, on my day off. I hope it doesn't rain when we go to the, the ball game. It's not pie in the sky thinking. This is a living, breathing, real hope based on a real event in history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we believe in the certainty of the resurrection because the tomb was empty. The disciples were changed. Even Christ's brothers who thought he was crazy. He thinks he's God, I'm not quite so sure. Just like any of you would think if your brother claimed that. Right? Um, but then seeing him alive again, okay, they're changed. They become witnesses. They become uh, writers of, of biblical books. Hundreds of witnesses saw him alive. Jesus is alive. And because of the resurrection, we have a living hope, one that will never die. And this living hope gives us strength. It should give us boldness like it did Peter. In a dying world, we see death, we see disease, we feel pain, we suffer, we get discouraged. We're groaning because of what sin has done to this world, to our bodies. And so life is hard. Without Jesus Christ, it's hopeless too. So hope is not found. It's not found in a. It's not found in a bottle. It's not found in recreational uh, pharmaceuticals. It's not 
found in a spouse or the stock market or any of those things. Because those things will get old. Those things will fade away. But as the hymn states, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And so our living hope is our risen Savior. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because we know who holds the future. Because of that, our lives are worth living. Because he lives. That's Peter's message here. And so the resurrection gives us new life when we were dead in sin. It gives us a living hope in a dying world. And lastly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ means we can have a secure future when our world seems like it's falling apart. And that's what we see in verses 4 and 5. It says, uh, we are born again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, in verse 3, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So what Jesus Christ offers the world through his death, through his resurrection, is a future in glory, a future that is secure. No matter what happens here, we really look forward to this hope we do. You know, sadly, I think many Christians get caught up in the earthly things. You know, and then that leads to, to bitterness. The earthly things, things aren't going so well here, and, and I'm miserable. Because our focus isn't on Jesus Christ. It's not focused on our future. And the more we get consumed with our earthly stuff, our, our pleasures, our comforts, the easier it is to become miserable. And, and, and these believers were facing uh, a hostile culture, a miserable life. So, so Peter says, don't focus on what's going on here. Focus on what you have in Christ. Look to your inheritance. It's never going to be taken away from you. If we don't focus on what Jesus has in store for us, we will have difficulty. We're going to have difficulty anyway, but it's going to be hard. And so Peter says, to those of you who are, who are dealing with trials, listen up. This world, your world may be falling apart right now, but your future isn't. Your inheritance isn't. They may take your stuff. They may take your freedom. They may take your lives. But you have something reserved for you in heaven that they can never take away. Your future is secure. And that's what he said. You have an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, that faded not away. It's reserved in heaven for you. Those of you who are being kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ secures for us an imperishable and incorruptible inheritance. The word incorruptible means it will last. It's not going to spoil. Jesus says in Matthew in chapter 6, uh, verses 19 through 21, he says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. He says, don't get caught up with the things here, because if thieves can take them, they will rot, they will corrupt, they will go away. They're not going to last. Set your affections on the things above, on your heavenly inheritance. Let your future glory motivate you here and now. Because everything on this earth has a shelf life. Everything will spoil, even hot dogs, even, even Twinkies. You say, no, I can, I can microwave a Twinkie years after it's expired, it's still good. No, everything will perish eventually. But not our heavenly inheritance. It's incorruptible. It has no shelf life. It will never decay. It will never die. And this heavenly inheritance, this incorruptible inheritance, involves new glorified bodies, we read in the resurrection chapter in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, so is also the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, but it is raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown in natural body, but it's raised in spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And then further down it says, I show you a mystery, but shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, and the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And so because Christ is risen, our future inheritance is secure, and we are promised new glorified bodies that will never wear down, that never develop aches and pains, they will be perfect. When I was younger, this didn't appeal to me as much as it does now. I know I'm not that old. I just turned 38, so some people like to think that I'm old. Now I am. Here, um, to say you're so much older than me. 
And I usually don't feel that old, uh, except sometimes when I wake up. You know, when I was when I was in my twenties, I could, or a teenager, I can go back further. When I was a teenager, I could I could probably sleep uh, on a cement floor with a uh, with a rock for a pillow for fourteen hours straight, never straight, never wake up once, wake up and good to go. Now I can sleep on a comfy bed with the most comfortable pillow for six hours, waking up every few hours, and wake up in pain. <laughs> And so I know my body is decaying. I don't want to admit it, uh, but I know it's getting older. I can look at pictures and see, oh yeah, you're, you're looking a little bit old, getting a little bit of gray there. Uh, but it's, it's decaying. Because all of our earthly bodies are wearing down. Like everything else in this world. And Jesus says he's going to give us new glorified bodies. In heaven where nothing rots out, where nothing gets old. Where nothing needs to be replaced. Where nothing gets broken. Not only do we have an incorruptible, imperishable inheritance with our imperishable bodies, our inheritance, it says, is undefiled, it's unstained, it's unpolluted, it's sin-proof. Sin cannot touch it, which is a great thing. It's in perfect condition, free from any spot, free from any dirt, free from any defect. There's nothing that defiles. It cannot be cheapened in any way. It will not disappoint us in any way. It's without sin. It's death and decay proof, it's sin proof, and it's also time proof. Peter says this inheritance will not fade away. It means it cannot and will not get old. You know, we lose the interest in things here sometimes pretty fast, especially in our, our culture of short attention spans. You know, we want new, different, bigger, better. We don't want more. And so this text says our future inheritance is never going to lose its shot. It's never going to wither away. It's not going to fade away. And that's what this word was used to describe it. Fading, the fading would describe flowers that would eventually wither up and lose their beauty. But that's not going to happen in heaven. It's not going to happen on the new earth. It's not going to lose its newness for us. We will continually be in awe in our future inheritance. You know, sometimes I think we get a little bit nervous about what heaven is going to be like. And we think, okay, well, I better have my fun here because in heaven I think it might be boring. Let me tell you this, I guarantee you heaven will not be boring. It's not going to be just us sitting around on clouds, strumming our harps, or chanting like monks. It's not going to be any of that. Singing kumbaya. Whatever happens there, it's not going to be boring. You notice when you read through the Bible and you study uh, heaven, you notice when those who have had a glimpse of heaven, they have a hard time describing it. And I think they have a hard time describing it because it's just so spectacular. It's nothing like, you can't compare it to anything that we have here. Right, so it's hard to put into words something that you can't compare it to. So a lot of times you're like, this, this is what's not there. Right, there's no tears, there's no sorrow, uh, there's no corruption. Like that's the best we can do because it is so magnificent and, and so glorious. I read a story of a, a dying man who asked this Christian doctor to tell him something about heaven. And the doctor is like, I'm not sure what I can tell you. And as he was trying to figure out how to answer this, this patient, he heard a scratching at the door, and, and he just had his answer. He said, do you hear that? He asked the patient. It's my dog, he said. I left him downstairs, but he's grown impatient. And he's come up here because he hears my voice. He has no idea what's behind this door, but he knows his master is there. He wants to be with his master. It's a perfect illustration of what heaven's going to be like. We don't know everything that it's going to be, but it doesn't really matter because our master is there. And that's what's really important. Jesus Christ is there, and we will be with him forever. And that's the main thing, isn't it? I mean, we know a little bit. We know that we have new bodies. We will never need uh, surgeries. We won't wake up with stiff necks. But we know Jesus is there. He's preparing a place for us. And no matter what else is there, Jesus is there. Our master is there. I mean, we can ask well, Paul and Moses, those guys will be there too. We can ask them all the questions we want. So it'll be wonderful. It's not going to be boring. We're going to be surrounded by the most breathtaking scenery that we've ever seen. Gold streets, even. You know, I kind of saw a joke where um, there was, I'll probably forget it because I wasn't planning on saying it, uh, but there was uh, these angels uh, up in heaven, and, and this guy came in with a suitcase full of gold because he wanted to have it with him. Uh, when he died, even though obviously it's not theologically accurate, 
which I have a hard time sharing those jokes. Uh, but uh, he comes up with his suitcase full of gold, uh, and Dan's like, well, what, what's he got in the suitcase? He opens it up. Oh, it's just pavement. <laughs> he's got a suitcase full of pavement. I don't know why, but that's what we have to look forward to. You know, we get used to stuff here. You know, people that, we go to the Grand Canyon, I've never been, but it's breathtaking. It's awe-inspiring. It's majestic. But the people who work there, eventually they lose that awe and wonder. You have some people, and I've met some in North Carolina, who think snow is beautiful. They think it's wonderful. Like, hey, I'll give you some. Um, but we deal with it perpetually. It's not awesome. It's awful, right? Um, it gets old fast. In heaven, in the new earth, nothing is going to get old. Nothing's going to run out. It's not going to fade away. Our future is unlike anything that we know of here. We don't know of anything that is death proof, anything that is decay proof. We don't know anything on earth that is free from sin. We don't understand things that don't get old, that don't fade. But that's how Peter describes our future. It's, it's unlike anything that we've ever experienced. And he says it's reserved, it's protected, and it's waiting for you. He says it's reserved there in the end of verse 4. That word means it's being guarded. It's better than any safe deposit box here, because the one who guards it has all the power and all authority. And the one who's guarding that is also guarding you. And so the idea is that God has stored away for each and every one of us who are in Christ a spiritual trust fund that he's never going to take back. No amount of wrong turns we may take, he's not sitting around there thinking, Wait, if he doesn't straighten up, I'll give his inheritance to someone else. No, God is keeping it for you who are in Christ. We may not be rich in earthly wealth, but we've been given riches beyond our wildest imagination in heaven. And God keeps it. And this is, belongs to those who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And those are every one of us who believe. This means in the same way that we're not kicking our kids out of the family and saying, okay, you blown it, no more inheritance for you. You're out of the family. God isn't doing that with us either. Those of us who have been born again were kept by God's power. We will never lose our salvation. We will never lose our inheritance. I saw this thing in the uh, Daily Bread uh, columnist, Ellen Boyd, described the amazing good fortune of a man named Jack Worm. Maybe you've heard of him. In 1949, Mr. Worm was broke. He was out of a job. One day he was walking along San Francisco Beach when he came across a bottle with a piece of paper in it. As he read the note, he discovered that it was the last will and testament of Daisy Singer Alexander, heir to the Singer sewing machine fortune. The note said this, to avoid confusion, I leave my, my entire estate to the lucky person who finds this bottle and to my attorney, Barry Cohen, share and share alike. And so according to the writer, the courts accepted the theory that the heiress had written the note 12 years earlier and thrown it into the bottle into a river, thrown the bottle into a river in London, and from there it drifted across the oceans to the feet of a penniless and jobless man named Jack Worm. His discovery netted him over six million dollars in cash and singer stock. How would you like to have been walking with him that day? Well, would have been nice, right? Well, we have something greater in Jesus Christ. We have an eternal inheritance, something that will never get old, something that we can never spend all of, something that will never run out, something that can never be stolen, never be corrupted, never get old. We have become heirs with Jesus Christ, and our future is secure. So no matter what you're facing today, health may be declining, you may have run out of answers, you may be discouraged in this world and feel like everything's falling apart. Peter says, know this. If you've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, because of his resurrection, your future is secure. It will never fall apart. Everything else may be falling apart, but your future will not. And so he says, look forward to this. Your trials and your troubles will not last forever, but your inheritance will. Without the resurrection, this is not possible. Without the resurrection, there is no inheritance. There is no eternal hope. There is no salvation. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, we're afflicted in every way, uh, we're perplexed, we're not driven to despair, we're persecuted, not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. And then he gives the reason why that is. He says, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed 
day by day, because this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And this is what keeps us going. We have a future that is far greater than anything we face here today. And it's possible because Jesus Christ is alive, because he is risen from the grave. And Paul says at the end of the great resurrection chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, he says, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain because of the resurrection. Because Jesus Christ is risen from the grave, we are transformed. We are to continually worship him, we're to continually renew our thinking. We're to continually have hope in a dying world. Christ's resurrection is the reason we live. It's the reason we serve. It's the reason we worship. It's the reason we have hope, forgiveness, and salvation. And so for Peter, he says, these riches that are given to you because of the resurrection are the reason why you can have joy in your trials. Because Christ is risen, we have new life for you were once dead. Because Christ is risen, we have a living hope in a dying world. And because Christ is risen, we have a secure future in a world that is falling apart. Resurrection for us is everything. Praise the Lord, he is risen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for his death, his burial, and we thank you for his resurrection. We thank you for the hope that we have because of it. Lord, we thank you for the salvation that you provide. We thank you for the hope that you provide. We thank you for the security in the future that you provide because Father, help us to shape the way that we live. Lord, help us to, to have the joy. Help, help us to have the power. Help us to have the ability to walk with you and live for you in this world, no matter what may come our way.